Okay, confession time. I love, love, love the Bravo TV reality show, Vanderpump Rules. It's about the young, good-looking staff of a restaurant in West Hollywood. I told you I had a bite of her pasta and then the whole thing was devoured oh and that's God. why you Why is it about on. the damn pasta? Get over the damn pasta, read between the f***ing lines. It ain't about the pasta. So you know that means non-stop drama and cheesemeg galore. It's not about the pasta. One of the stars is Lala Kent, who I'm not the biggest fan of. She's kind of stuck up. I am engaged to my soulmate, Randall Emmett. He is kind, he's generous. He makes me feel on a daily basis that I am the best person on the face of the earth. And Lala's boyfriend, then fiance on Vanderpump, was a film producer, Randall Emmett, a guy who was always flashing around his money and power. If you want $50,000 to produce this movie that starts next week, let me know. But little did I know that Randall would turn out to be the biggest drama of them all, with scores of lawsuits, allegations of abuse against women and assistants, and messing with the career of Bruce Willis. I'm telling you folks, Vanderpump Rules is chisme galore. I'm Gustavo Ariano. You're listening to The Times, daily news from the LA Times. It's Thursday, July 7th, 2022. Today, the rise and fall of a C-list movie producer and what it tells us about the Hollywood of today. Joining me are two LA Times colleagues who just published an investigation into Randall Emmett. Meg James covers corporate media, while Amy Kaufman is a senior entertainment writer. Meg, Amy, welcome to the Times. Thanks, Gustavo. Thank you, Gustavo. Okay, so I'm all about Vanderpump Rules, but had either of you ever seen the show until you co-wrote this investigation about Emmett? Um, no, not really. I've, uh, I'm not as big of a reality TV fan as Amy. I had seen the show. I'm a big reality TV fan, but Vanderpump is not one of my go-to staples. So, Meg, what is Randall Emmett's background? Like, where is he from and how did he first start in Hollywood? Yeah, I mean, he came out to Hollywood. He's a guy from Miami. He went to film school and then he came out here. He kind of did the assistant grind that most people do, you know, working at agencies. And then he ended up as Mark Wahlberg's assistant. And that was a really formative experience for him by, you know, what he said in interviews. And he became friends with Mark Wahlberg and sort of from there decided, I'm going to really dive into the film world and try to take a shot at becoming a film producer. And Meg, that was when he teamed up with George Furla. Right. In the late 90s, he was producing a movie called Speedway Junkie. And he was impressed by this former stock trader and former hedge fund manager, George Furla, who just without hesitation, invested $30,000 in his movie. And this is in the late 1990s. And from there, the two of them have been partners almost until now, actually. And Randall Emmett got into this interesting niche. I mean, there's so many different niches in Hollywood, but in this case, he would get like these big actors from like the 80s, 90s legends, Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, Bruce Willis, cast them for about, you know, on-screen roles, about 15 minutes or whatever, pay them a bunch of money, and then have these films that were critically just destroyed, but became hits in like Turkey, Latin America, across the Middle East. How did he get into that specific genre? And then how did he get that money to bank all these actors? There was a person who sort of mined that niche. His name is Abby Lerner. He was the first one to really dig into this whole genre of aging action stars. And Randall sort of picked up where Avi Lerner left off and then really took it into a higher gear. So Randall's been working in this space for almost 15 years. And really his go-to star was Bruce Willis. But he also turned to Robert De Niro, Mel Gibson, Al Pacino. You know, as you said, Sylvester Stallone and occasionally our former governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And as he started to make more of these movies, that's when I encountered Randall, you know, this big shot persona, a jerk mostly on Vanderpump Rules. And Amy, the two of you talked to former personal assistants of Randall who said that Randall's attitude on the show was similar to how he was off camera. 
I think there is an idea in Hollywood of the executive who sort of lords their power over assistants. And that was certainly the experience we heard from those assistants who'd worked for him. We talked to 10 of them and we heard countless stories of honestly, many employees who said they were traumatized by working for Randall. They were chewed out over things as small as getting the wrong ice cream sandwich. But then, as we detail in the story, Randall was allegedly having the assistants retrieve drugs for them, um, cocaine for them, some of them told us, and then pay women on his behalf, allegedly. One of the things that struck me was that Randall would, quote unquote, soft fire them. There were times where they would do the smallest thing that he didn't like, and he would say, you're fired. In text and in person, they'd send him home. And so several of these assistants said that having this threat of being fired always hanging over their head also was unnerving. They said, you know, really traumatized them. One of the assistants whom we spoke with, Martin DeBlay, came to Hollywood. He had been working at agencies and he got what he felt like was going to be this dream job in early 2020 before the pandemic even started. And he became an executive assistant for Randall Emmett. Randall actually sent voice memos to Martin, which his former assistant provided to the LA Times. Martin, I'm asking you to call me, please. Okay? I'm just asking you to call me on the phone. I'm offering you to go next week and go produce this movie. I'm a good person. Please just call me, okay? Suddenly his job took a, what he said, a very dark turn. He was asked to allegedly retrieve drugs for Randall on a movie shoot in Puerto Rico. We did talk to another assistant who corroborated Martin's account. Martin said that over the course of his tenure at Emmett Furla Productions, there were many expenses he wasn't reimbursed for, which was an allegation that several assistants had made. So many of these assistants were asked to put personal expenses on their credit cards. And these are people who were not being well paid. They were being paid, you know, $30,000, $40,000 a year. And several said they went into debt, including Martin. Randall's representative said that Martin and the others were reimbursed for their expenses. Coming up after the break, Randall Emmett finally is about to break through into serious Hollywood, then controversy. Amy, Randall Emmett was doing these like C-list action movies, but before the pandemic, some of the projects that he backed, they were actually getting serious respect. What were they? So he started to work on a few movies that maybe some of your listeners would be familiar with. There was Lone Survivor, which was a movie he made with Mark Wahlberg. If you remember, we told you he worked with him as his assistant. Uh, the Lone Survivor was about a Navy SEALs mission to take out a Taliban leader and Universal Pictures released the film in 2013. It did more than 150 million box office worldwide. It really established Randall as someone who produced more than these schlocky action films. Yeah, then he started getting in with Scorsese, right, Amy? Yeah, so in 2016 uh, comes this movie, Silence. Ferreira is lost to us. He denounced God in public. And basically, that was a movie from Scorsese. It was a passion project that Scorsese had been trying to get made for years and years. I'm not sure how many of your listeners have seen it because it wasn't that widely seen, even though it did get a pretty strong, positive, critical reaction. It had Andrew Garfield and Adam Driver in it. And basically, just because of the content, Scorsese couldn't get financiers interested. And Randall got wind that Scorsese could not get the money to push this film over the finish line. In his words, he did an interview talking about this, where he goes to meet Scorsese in New York and he's perspiring and hyperventilating. And basically he says, you know, Scorsese's like, okay, well, why should I, you know, make this movie with you? And he's like, because I'll do whatever the F you want, basically, <laughs> is the way he put it. 
Scorsese was convinced to go to the Cannes Film Festival, where filmmakers go sometimes to help raise financing for their movies and schmooze with foreign film investors who are going to release the movie in their country, which, as we've discussed, is a niche Randall is very well versed in. And that's how they secured the last bit of the money to make Silence. And in exchange for that, Randall got to be one of the 20, I believe, producers on The Irishman, which came out in 2019, starred Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, was a huge hit and nominated for an Oscar. And then Randall gets in a public fight with, of all people, rap legend 50 Cent. Oh, the Fofty Gate? Okay, let's discuss Fofty Gate. <laughs> So what happened was 2019, 50 Cent and Randall have been business partners for around a decade at this point. At first, 50, whose real name is Curtis Jackson, was in a bunch of movies with Randall when he sort of went from rapping to acting and, and Randall helped him with that transition. Then they became producers together. They teamed on that show, Power, which is on Stars. It was a very popular show. The boss is here. It's banging the night. Then they went on to do BMF, which is Black Mafia Family on Stars. But in 2019, 50 gets on his Instagram and he's like, Yo, Randall, you owe me a million dollars and you've owed me a million dollars for six years. And basically they get into this back and forth where 50 goes all out. He puts the tax exchanges with Randall about the alleged missing money on his Instagram. He says money by Monday. He's getting personal with Lala Kent, Randall's fiance at the time, making really you know, insulting digs towards her. And then he puts the text up where Randall is begging 50 to stop posting the text. And he says, he means to say 50, please. And he says, Fofty. We reviewed a lot of texts from Randall and he's not the best with spelling just from our review. So he writes Fofty instead of 50 and all these memes pop up. And he's like, Fofty, please. I'm having chest pains. I need to go to the hospital. And um, no one was really taking Randall's claims seriously because they just became this viral meme. Okay, has Randall always called you Fofty? Was that a typo? Uh, uh, that was, yeah, he was speeding. He, that was a typo. Okay. Fast. And eventually, 50 did get paid because he took it public. I think that helped it. And we discovered in the course of this investigation, they actually, behind closed doors, had signed a settlement agreement to sort of put the suit to rest. And as part of it, 50 or Fofty said, you cannot even come within a hundred feet of me at the premiere of Black Mafia Family, so. Do you regret taking your beef with Randall to social media? No, I got me paid right away, you paid right away. You What's your paid? friendship, <laughs> what is your friendship status with them, with Randall and Lala currently? I, I don't, you know, I don't have a problem with them. Have you spoken to them since? No, I Will you be attending their wedding? No, I won't be there. I remember all of that going down on social media. My wife and I were all over that. And then on Vanderpump Rules, a show, Lala Kent, Randall's fiance at the time, accused him of infidelity. But Amy, the two of you also began to hear from multiple women who had accused Randall of pursuing them in inappropriate ways, which Randall denies. In 2017, I had heard from some women who alleged that Randall had been inappropriate with them. But when we started diving into the world of Randall Emmett this year, we found a number of claims against him, including a settlement agreement that was allegedly made between Randall and a woman represented by Gloria Allred, the attorney who's been involved in many sexual misconduct lawsuits and has represented Bill Cosby's victims and the like. In this settlement, this actress was told that if she were to allegedly perform sexual favors for Randall, that she would receive acting work in his movies. And so from 2012 to 2015, they had this sort of relationship. And eventually the actress realized what she said had happened to her and how she had been traumatized by it and retained counsel. How has Randall responded to all of these allegations, allegations of verbally and mentally abusing his assistants, sexual harassment allegations, everything that you and Amy detailed? Randall responded quite aggressively saying that, no, he did not 
do any of these things that our sources alleged and what the story has alleged. The pushback was pretty hard, but we really painstakingly documented so many of these instances and um, had corroboration and had documentation that backed it up. But Randall has denied all the allegations. His spokesperson pushed back sometimes in sort of a weird way. In fact, we had one of the few female assistants. She beat Randall in a ping pong match. Randall threw the paddle against a door and cracked the glass. The pushback was Randall never threw a paddle, but yet another one of Randall's assistants went on the record to say, yes, in fact, he witnessed the incident, although he characterized it less as being sort of a menacing, scary incident, more of just sort of like a good natured thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a cracking uh, window with uh, paddles, always a good natured thing. And Amy, wasn't there also someone who claimed that you uh, misquoted her, even though you never actually interviewed her? Yes, there was a woman I spoke to who made some allegations in an interview. And then when we brought our comments to Randall to have him respond to all the allegations that we were preparing to put in the story, he responded by sending a number of sworn declarations, basically with people coming to his defense. And then there was one from a woman named Grace McCarthy who said, I spoke to Amy and in fact, I lied to her about everything that I told her in the interview. And so she was then an unreliable witness and we could not use anything she had said in the interview. But what was interesting about that was that in the interview, she had mentioned something that happened with a friend of hers named Samantha Raquel. And I, of course, when she told me about this, tried to reach out to Samantha Raquel, but was never able to conduct an interview with her. But what Randall's team sent in their declaration bunch was a declaration from Samantha Raquel, similar to the one from Grace McCarthy saying, I spoke to Amy Kaufman as well, and I also lied to her in our interview, but I had never interviewed Samantha Raquel. Nothing like that has ever happened in reporting a story. Yeah, the cheese is real here. More after the break. Megan, Amy, Randall Emmett wasn't really a name outside of the reality TV or this niche world of action films until March. That's when Bruce Willis's family announced that the movie star was retiring because of a cognitive disorder. And the both of you wrote that when finances were tight for Randall, that sources would often hear him discussing making, quote, another bullshit Bruce Willis movie. And Randall had denied this through his spokesperson. But was there exploitation of Bruce Willis by Randall? This is a really tough question to get an answer to, Gustavo. And Amy and I did a ton of reporting actually before Bruce's family made the announcement. So we had a story that was published by the LA Times back in late March in which we had spoken to more than two dozen people who had worked on film sets and they were really distressed and disturbed by the decline that Bruce Willis had shown. He's been diagnosed with aphasia, which is a condition where it makes it hard to communicate, both speak and understand. But what was showing in this current story was that Bruce Willis's condition was really deteriorating more than two years ago. And on this one particular movie that Randall Emmett produced, Midnight on the Switchgrass, he was unable to kick open a door to a scene to come in and rescue this actress, Megan Fox, who was playing against him in this movie. And they tried and they tried and they tried to have this scene where Bruce would actually kick open the door and they could not get him to. And I think that our reporting back in March showed that many people were concerned about Bruce's health. And also our most recent story showed that even after it was clear that Bruce Willis was struggling, Randall Emmett made five more movies with Bruce Willis as the star. 
Now, the reason why Bruce Willis was so important to Randall's company was Bruce is loved around the world. His films will sell. Just having Bruce's name and his, his picture in a movie poster or a little thumbnail on a streaming service is golden for any movie producer. So having Bruce perform in Randall's movies was hugely important. And also, Randall paid really good money for Bruce to perform. Bruce was making like $1 million a day. Usually he'd shoot for two days. So he'd be making, you know, $2 million for two days of shooting. And it's hard to really figure out if there is exploitation. Bruce's attorney has said that Bruce wanted to work. He was capable of working and that because he worked, these films could get financing, which is all true. So the exploitation question is really a thicket. As the LA Times, we can't diagnose when somebody should be working and shouldn't be working. I think what we did hear from numerous people on movie sets was like they felt really squeamish and, and really uncomfortable with the situation. Yeah, concern, totally. So what do you think the rise and fall of Randall Emmett teaches? I think that the rise and fall of Randall Emmett is, well, it's a few things. Um, I think that the reason we wanted to tell this story is maybe you know him from Vanderpump Rules, but it's not someone that maybe we would spend four months diving into just based on the name alone. The reason we wanted to tell the story is because we thought it was important in the wake of Me Too, in the wake of Pay Up Hollywood, which was the movement where assistants were trying to get fair wages for their work, to show that this type of alleged behavior is still going on and that people use their association with movie stars, even as limited as it may be or as schlocky as it may seem, to engage in this kind of alleged misconduct. The parable is that alleged bad behavior eventually catches up with you. I mean, the sort of the bigger takeaway is how you treat people is important. Meg James, Amy Kaufman, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you, Gustavo. Thanks, Gustavo. We'll have to watch Vanderpump together sometime. And that's it for this episode of The Times, Daily News from the LA Times. Denise Guerra, David Toledo, and Surya Hendry were the jefes on this episode, and Mario Diaz mixed and mastered it. Our show is produced by Shannon Lynn, Denise Guerra, Tasha Brasalian, David Toledo, and Ashley Brown. Our editorial assistants are Madeline Amato and Carlos De Loera. Our intern is Surya Hendry. Our engineers are Mario Diaz, Mark Nieto, and Mike Heflin. Our editor is Kinsey Moreland. Our executive producers are Hasmin Aguilera and Shani Hilton, and our theme music is by Andrew Eatman. I'm Gustavo Ariano. We'll be back tomorrow with all the news in this madre. Gracias. <laughs>